Well, good evening. Good to see everybody. So we started on Sunday looking at how God has communicated to us in his word. And we said that God communicated to us in exactly the same ways and forms of communication that we use with one another. So that when we come to the Bible and we read the Bible, the question, how should we understand the Bible, in really simple terms could be answered, well, you understand it in the same way that you understand any form of communication. If God had communicated to us in some kind of concealed, mystical, coded language, then that couldn't be said to be a revelation of God's mind at all, could it? That would be a concealing of the mind of God. So God has communicated with us by telling us things directly, by showing us examples of things that are good and bad, things that he approves of and disapproves of. And in other cases, we are to take things that God has said or shown us and reach logical conclusions or inferences of what God expects us to gather. Now, we, among churches of Christ, have been trying to make this point for a long time, and we have usually utilized terminology like this. Scripture teaches us in the forms of commands that come from God, examples and inferences. And I think there's a lot of people who looked at that and said, well, where, where do you see that in the Bible? I mean, where did Jesus say, you know, thou must look for commands, examples, and inferences? Well, no, he didn't say that. But what we tried to convey in Sunday's class is that this is just how communication works. We tell people things, we show them things, and we give them enough information that we expect them to reach reasonable conclusions. But what I want to do tonight with you is to show you that we among churches of Christ are not the only people who have come to understand this. We are not the only ones who talk about commands, examples, and inferences. In fact, if you go throughout history, you will read a lot of writings and you'll see a lot of quotations from thought leaders from various religious movements who have said a lot of things that sure sound like the things that I have preached before and the things that Joe has preached before and many others of gospel preachers. We are not the only ones who have said this, but I have seen in recent years, and I'm sure you have as well, that some have become very critical of this idea of commands, examples, and inferences, and they say, oh, that's just a Church of Christ thing. That's just Church of Christ doctrine. In fact, there are some people who sit in pretty lofty seats among our brethren, people who are professors at, and I don't like this term, okay, but I'm going to put this in air quotes, Church of Christ schools and colleges, okay, who have become very critical, outspoken critics on this idea, and their influence is spreading. And so I think it's worthy of our consideration to look back into history a little bit and to realize that, you know, it isn't just us, us, who's been saying these things, but actually what we are suggesting has actually been around for a very long time. And it even goes back into the scripture itself. So I have one very simple point that I want to get across to you tonight, and that is that these concepts of biblical authority, the need for our authority in religious matters, and when it comes to questions like how should we worship and we need authority, that is not some Church of Christ idea. 
A lot of people have been saying this for a very long time. All throughout history and even today, there are people who are not associated with churches of Christ who come from other religious traditions and backgrounds who use this exact same kind of terminology. All right? So, one of the things we touched on early in our classes was the sufficiency of Scripture. That God's Word is all that we need. We don't need God's Word plus other things. Scripture is sufficient for what we need. I want to share with you a quote from a man that you've probably heard of. A man named John Calvin. Mr. Calvin said, When it is a matter of worshiping God, we are not to give any attention whatever to our own imagination. But we are to follow in all simplicity what he has ordained in his word without adding anything to it at all. Pierre Varey, who was a French reformer from the 1500s. You've probably never heard of him. He's not a very well-known reformist. God does not wish to be served according to the will and the imagination of man, but according to his own will. This is why he has universally forbidden all men to add unto the word which I commanded you. These kind of sound like Church of Christ preachers, don't they? How about this? John Knox, who was the founder of the Presbyterian Church in Scotland, another reformer, 1500s, all worshiping, honoring, or service invented by the brain of man in the religion of God without his own express commandment is idolatry. I'm going to get through the historical part pretty quickly, okay? Just bear with me. In 1689, the London Baptist Confession of Faith was written. This is kind of lengthy, but they said in that statement... The whole counsel of God concerning all things necessary for his own glory, man's salvation, faith, and life is either expressly set down or necessarily contained in the scripture. I want you to notice that language. It's expressly set down or it is necessarily contained. Unto which nothing at any time is to be added, whether by new revelation of the spirit or traditions of men. The acceptable way of worshiping the true God is instituted by himself and so limited by his own revealed will that he may not be worshiped according to the imagination and devices of men or any other way not prescribed in the Holy Scriptures. Okay, so we've got some quotes from the 1500s and one from the late 1600s of people saying, basically, we should only follow the Bible. Okay? Okay. Well, do we have anybody in modern times saying this kind of thing? Well, Michael Griggs, I don't know anything about this man other than what he has written in a book of his that I purchased, but he is some kind of a Protestant. I'm not sure what specific flavor, but here's what he said. First, the sufficiency of the scripture. To add extra biblical elements of worship to our services is a denial of the sufficiency of scripture. To say on one hand that the Bible is sufficient... And then to say that we must add things that aren't in the Bible in order to really worship God is a contradiction. Second, the only way to be sure your worship is pleasing to God is to do what the Bible says to do. Okay. Mr. Griggs, as I said, is a Protestant of some kind. I don't know. But beloved, doesn't that sound like something that you might hear me or Joe say? You see, it isn't just churches of Christ that are saying these things. Well, what about all this business of commands and examples and inferences? I mean, surely nobody else talks like that, right? Surely that's just preachers among churches of Christ. Well, here's that same gentleman, Mr. Griggs. He's talking about the story of Cain and Abel, and he says, this passage implies <clears throat> that when God gives instruction by command or example... We may not deviate from it. It also shows that God doesn't accept all types of worship that we may choose to offer. Isn't that interesting? It implies there are commands and there are examples. All right, we'll go back in time just a little bit to a man named John Gerardo, 1888. He wrote a book about instrumental music in the public worship of the church. Mr. Gerardo was a reformed Presbyterian, and he was a... Uh, professor at a seminary. 
he argued against instrumental music in worship. And here's what he said. A divine warrant is necessary for every element of doctrine, government, and worship in the church. That is, whatsoever in these spheres is not commanded in the scriptures, either expressly or by good and necessary consequence from their statements, is forbidden. You see it? Command, good and necessary consequence or inference. It's the same idea. Joe? Yeah, that's, <laughs> that's interesting. Um, I don't want to spend too much time on this, but I'll tell you in short. The prevailing alternative is we should just let Jesus be our example and follow Jesus and everything. So practically speaking, if Jesus did it in his life or in his teaching, then it's okay for us to do too. Because he's the greatest example. And so if he did it, then so can we. Okay? Now, hang on, Alan. Now, I think there is certainly an element of truth to that, right? I mean, 1 Peter 2 and verse 22, 24, I forget, specifically says Jesus is our example. Of course he's our example. And the things that Jesus did, we should do. But there are limitations that practically would come about with this, okay? So, Jesus healed innumerable sick people. Well, well, does that mean that, you know, a church should open up a hospital and start trying to do the same thing because that's what Jesus did? You see, if, if that's the model we follow, I think we get into some really difficult places. Jesus was a single man who was homeless, who was dependent almost entirely on the benevolence of other people. Well, does that mean that that's what we all have? To, is it wrong to own a house? Is, you see, I think it leads us to some difficult places. Alan and then Matt. Yes, okay, that's good. And we're going to deal with that. We are going to talk about that. Matt. Right. I can feel him speaking to me. I can feel it. It really is less about the, what's said and more about how they feel in the moment. And in fairness to that point, right, and I think we, we all should say this. I, I know that we might say, well, you know, your feelings don't matter when it comes to this. And that's true. And yet, at the same time, think about your own religious life. Think about the experiences that you have had in worship with God's people, and the feelings that that evokes for you, I don't want you to throw that out and dismiss that, right? I mean, I want you to feel good about the things that, that God has done in our lives and the things that his people do in our lives. Of course we should feel good about that. But what we're saying is feelings are not the authority on these. Feelings don't trump the things that God has said in his word. All right, I got a few more quotes, and then we'll, we'll wrap up this kind of overview section and talk about why these things are really significant. All right, the next one is from... Two men who wrote a book together that I'm, I'm still working through. I've read through most of this, but Ernest Reisinger and Matthew Allen. These men are, are Baptists. I think they would consider themselves to be primitive Baptists. Um, and most of what they have said in their book is really good as it relates to this topic. Okay, So they set out early in the book to just define what they meant by this expression, regulative principle. That's a fancy phrase that's used for what we are saying in this class, that God has regulated things in Scripture, okay? Our first goal is to examine whether the regulative principle itself is scriptural. In other words, so here, here's what they tell us what the regulative principle is. To determine whether Christians are limited in worship to what is commanded, either explicitly or by reasonable inference. And then later in their book, they say this. When you're trying, in, in the context, they're talking about how to determine if a practice should be included into corporate worship of the church. And they have a step-by-step decision-making process. 
And uh, this was step two or step three. I don't remember. It doesn't matter. Ask whether the practice is biblically authorized. This inquiry involves determining whether the practice is expressly commanded, authorized by example, or authorized by reasonable inference. Look at that. These are primitive Baptists who are saying Bible authority matters, commands, examples, and inferences. Well, wait, I, I thought this was just something that a bunch of Church of Christ preachers got together and organized around a table a hundred years ago. No, it's not. And they go on to say, if the event of worship is not biblically authorized in one of these ways, even if it is not specifically prohibited, to Alan's point earlier, then it must be abandoned. Practices antithetical to the express commands and the implicit teachings of Scripture, of course, are also prohibited. Okay. I just wanted you to see... Wow, Arlie, the look on your face right now. You, 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 you kind of got this... Oh, down here? That's just the names of these guys. I'm just telling you who said it. <laughs> All I'm doing with this is showing you that this is not something that's exclusive to churches of Christ. Okay? Lots of religious teachers throughout history have said, this is how God speaks to us. He gives us instructions via commands. He shows us examples. And we draw necessary conclusions from things that he has told us. Now, a couple of things I want to say about this before we open the Bible. First, I want to be clear on this. My inclusion of these quotations is not an endorsement of any of these guys. I, I think you know that, but I feel like I should say that. The only thing that these men have taught that I would endorse is what I've put on the screen. I'm not endorsing anything else. John Calvin is light years away from me <laughs> in other things in Scripture, okay? So this is not an endorsement of these men. I'm only endorsing what I have put up on the screen. Now, you might be thinking, okay, well, if these guys all say this, and they say this is how they understand Scripture, this is how they approach the Bible, then why is it that we're all over the map? Why do we differ with these guys if we're all in agreement on this fundamental point? And the answer to that is the application of these things. We're applying this in a different way. I'll give you a specific example from these two guys. Uh, Reisinger and Allen. In their book, they argue, rightfully, for the practice of believers' baptism via immersion. And they say, because it is expressly commanded in Scripture, we have countless examples of it in Scripture, we see this again and again, we should practice believers' baptism. Okay, so I read that and I say, great, good, you got it. But at the same time, they then turn to the topic of instrumental music and they say, well, commands, examples, that's just stretching too far. We're not going to condemn that. To which I would look at that and say, well, why not? <laughs> Why'd you stop? Why, why doesn't that apply to that topic? But notice the argument, the problem is not with this. The problem is in the application of this. You follow me? We agree on this, but where we differ is the application of it. Well, which topics does it apply to? I would say all of them. They're not going that far. Okay. So, when you hear someone say, commands, examples, inferences... Telling, showing, implying, oh, that's just Church of Christ gobbledygook. Nobody else views the Bible that way. Now you can say, actually, that's not true. And someone who says that really has just done zero research on the subject because you can find these quotes very easily. 
very easily, most of these. Okay, now, all of these quotations I just put on the screen, what makes these quotations helpful and important is not that these men said these things. The question is, where did these men get this idea? Bible authority, commands, examples, where did that come from? These quotations that I just shared with you are not important because John Calvin said Scripture alone, because John Knox said Scripture. Who cares what they said if it doesn't align with Scripture, right? But all of these men got the idea. Where do you think they got it? They got it from the Scripture. They came to these conclusions using Scripture itself. So, now let's get our Bibles. Let's go to Exodus chapter 40. Let's start there. Exodus 40. I know it's been a history class so far. I apologize for that. But now we're going to open up the hydrant and we're going to get lots and lots of Bible. And these are passages that you're familiar with. But I want to show you some things. Exodus chapter 40 is where we're going to begin. God has spent the last several chapters of the book of Exodus talking about preparation to build what? The tabernacle. All right, good. And he gives Moses instruction about how to build the tabernacle. And I'm not asking for specifics, but tell me this. When God gave Moses the instructions regarding the construction of the tabernacle, did he give him just vague generalities? Moses, just do whatever you want to do. Or did he give him very specific and precise instructions? Yeah, very specific and precise. And do you think that God expected Moses to do that? Or was that just God talking and maybe he was just hoping Moses would take something from it? No, he expected Moses to do it, right? So when you come to chapter 40 and you start at verse 16, Thus Moses did according to all that the Lord had commanded him, so he did. And you're going to see that all throughout the rest of the book. Verse 19, end of the verse, Just as the Lord had commanded Moses. Verse 21, Just as the Lord had commanded Moses. You see it in verse 23, Verse 25, verse 27, verse 29, verse 32. So what's the takeaway? After several chapters of specific, detailed, precise instructions, what does Moses do with it? He does everything that God has instructed him to do. He did what God had commanded. And when this was done, verse 34 says... Then the cloud covered the tent of meeting, and the glory of the Lord filled the tabernacle. And it was such an impressive sight. The next verse says Moses couldn't go into the tabernacle because God's glory and presence was there, and it was so profound. God filled this house when Moses followed the instructions that God gave. All right. Let's go to Leviticus now. I understand recently that Joe did a sermon about Leviticus 10 and Nadab and Abihu. And so I don't want to rehash all of those things that were said in the sermon. But if we're going to understand the story of Nadab and Abihu in Leviticus 10, we really need to start in Leviticus 8. In Leviticus 8, you have the details of the consecration of the priests. And here's the procedures for uh, consecrating priests for their service. And so Moses and Aaron, the high priest, and Aaron's sons, the priests, are all going to be there together going through these consecration procedures. So I want you to look at verse uh, 2. Take Aaron and his sons with him. And here comes the consecration process. I point that out to you to say Nadab and Abihu are there throughout this whole process. They know what's been instructed. Verse 4, Moses did just as the Lord commanded him. Verse 5, Moses says, this is the thing which the Lord has commanded to do. All right? Now, you see that same expression. I'm going to point out some of them. 
verse 9, just as the Lord had commanded Moses. Verse 13, verse 17, verse 21, verse 29, all right, on and on. Then you come into chapter 9, and it says in verse 5, they took what Moses had commanded, a little different, but not really, because the command that Moses gave came from God. Verse 6, this is the thing which the Lord has commanded you to do. It's in verse 7, verse 16, verse 21, verse 23, verse 24. 18 times in chapters 8 and 9, 18 times you see the expression, just as the Lord commanded Moses, or something really close to that. 18 times. Now come to chapter 10 and look at verse 1. Now Nadab and Abihu, the sons of Aaron, took their respective fire pans and after putting fire in them, placed incense on it and offered strange fire before the Lord, which he had... What does it say? Ah! Oh. <laughs> Why is that significant? Because this is the first time in this whole setting when something not commanded by God was done. Okay? You see the significance of that? They are there going through this consecration process and they're hearing over and over again all of the commands that Moses is giving by God. This is what God said. This is what God said. This is what God said. And then they get the bright idea to go do something that God didn't say. Stop me at any point if you have a comment. David. Oh, that's right. I thought you were going to say profane, because some translations say profane fire. Uh, oh, yeah, that's right. Unauthorized. The ESV. Hey, go ESV. That's good. Okay. Anything else? All right. How about this story? I know you know this one. Story of Uzzah, right? What did Uzzah do? He's the one that reached up and touched the ark, and God struck him dead. Okay, we're not going to review that story. I know you know that. But I do want to look at First Chronicles 15 with you. In 1 Chronicles 13, that's when Uzzah touches the ark and dies. In chapter 15, David looks back at that episode and he says, you know, we didn't do it right the first time. We need to change this. So in chapter 15, he calls in verse 11 for the priests. And he says in verse 13 of chapter 15, because you did not carry it at the first, the Lord our God made an outburst on us, for we did not seek him according to the ordinance. So the priests and the Levites consecrated themselves to bring up the ark of the Lord God of Israel. The sons of the Levites carried the ark of God on their shoulders with the poles thereon, as Moses had commanded according to the word of the Lord. What did David realize was the problem from chapter 13 when they tried to move it before? We didn't follow God's instruction. We didn't do what God commanded. So now we should go back, look at what Moses said, and do that. Okay? All right, how about this one? Nehemiah chapter 8. This is an interesting chapter. The people of Israel have come back from captivity and they have requested that Ezra, the scribe, bring the law of Moses and read it to the people. And chapter 8 says that Ezra read to them for six hours on the first day. Yeah, yeah, I said, <laughs> that was funny. I said six hours and Megan shot up like, what, what? six hour sermon? Are you kidding me? Yeah, you're welcome, guys. 40 minutes. That's, that's what me and Joe average. You're welcome. No. All right. He read for six hours. And it says that he did this for seven days. And when he was reading, it says in verse 14, this was on the second day, verse 13 says, they found in the law 
how the Lord had commanded through Moses that the sons of Israel should live in booths during the feast of the seventh month. So they had this feast of tabernacles or feast of tents or booths where the people were instructed to make these uh, temporary shelters out of branches and live in those tents for seven days. So as Ezra is reading, they come across this instruction. And the people say, uh, we haven't been doing that. Like, we haven't done that for a really long time. In fact, if you look at verse 17, it says, They had not done so from the days of Joshua the son of Nun to that day. And there was great rejoicing. They have not done this for centuries. But when Ezra reads it, what did the people do? Hey, we should probably go and do that. God commanded us to do this. We should go do this. And so they go out and they chop down branches. They make these tents and they live in them for a week. Why? Because God commanded them to do it. All right. Somebody, everybody, it'd be good, but turn to Romans 15. And I'd like somebody with a nice big loud voice to read this. Romans 15 and verse 4. I'll even bring you the mic if you want to read into the mic. Romans 15, verse 4. Any takers? Dad? All right. Okay, whatever was written in former times was written for our instruction. When we read Old Testament stories about God and His dealings with men, we should learn from those stories. So we should look at the story of Moses and the tabernacle, and Moses did everything that God told him to do, and when he obeyed God, God's glory filled that tabernacle. That's a good thing. We should learn from that. We should learn from Moses' obedience. Nadab and Abihu, when they didn't do what God said, God struck them dead. We should learn from that. And we should understand that we should obey God. If we don't, there's consequences. So when we look to Old Testament stories, we should learn something about what God expects from us. But that's just Old Testament, preacher. You got any New Testament passages? Plenty. Plenty. So let's go to 1 Corinthians, chapter 14. 1 Corinthians 14, those were supposed to come up separately, but they, uh, they came up together. 1 Corinthians 14, can anybody help me on context here? What's Paul talking about in this chapter? True, specifically regarding... Spiritual gifts, miraculous gifts of the Holy Spirit. Okay. He's telling the Corinthians, this is how you should conduct your worship when you have multiple people who have spiritual gifts among you. And he gives instruction to tongue speakers and to prophets and so forth. So he is telling them, this is how your worship ought to be conducted. But you know, there might be somebody who reads Paul's instructions and they say, I don't like that. I don't want to do what you're saying. I have a gift and I want to use it. Paul deals with that. Verse 37. If anyone thinks he is a prophet or spiritual, let him recognize that the things which I write to you are the Lord's commandment. But if anyone does not recognize this, he is not recognized. You don't like what I'm saying? Take it up with the Lord. This is his commandment. All right? So these commandments that Paul has given, these instructions he's given in this chapter, something else he says in this book, in chapter 4, that I think we need to catch. Chapter 4 and verse 17. For this reason I have sent to you Timothy, who's my beloved and faithful child in the Lord, and he will remind you of my ways which are in Christ just as I teach everywhere in every church. I want you to think through the big picture of this. 
So the apostles go out into the world preaching the gospel. They convert people, they establish churches. What they teach in those churches about how to live the Christian life, how to be a good wife and a good husband and a good parent, what they teach about how the church is to worship and what should be done and what should not be done in worship, you know, like 1 Corinthians 14, when they teach about the second coming of Christ and they, they go through all kinds of these doctrines and different teachings, they teach the same things everywhere they go. Now, what should that create? If the apostles are teaching the same things everywhere they go, what should that create? Consistency, unity, somebody said. Good. What else? Uniformity, right? That's unity. But uniformity. So if Paul was to go to Ephesus and worship with the church there, then go to Corinth and worship there, what should the two worship periods look like? It ought to be the same, right? Have you ever noticed when you visit churches in other places that the worship that they do pretty much exactly the same as what we do here. That's the way it's supposed to be. Now, the order might be different. You know, we might have two songs and a prayer, and they might have three songs and two prayers. Okay, but fundamentally, we're doing the same things. Why? Because we all have the same teaching from the apostles. All right? Joe, did you have your hand up? You, you, you're kind of doing a halfway. Th I thought that was a hand raised. Okay, all right. So, when Paul said in 1 Corinthians 14, 37, the things I write to you are the Lord's commandment. You think Paul expected them to obey those commandments? Yeah, I think so. And so then we can go back to these Old Testament stories about God's commandments and how did people respond to those? Did they obey them? Did they not? What were the consequences of that? And then an apostle of Jesus Christ says, this is God's commandment. Romans 15, 4 says, we should learn from these as we think about these. All right, let's look at one more. Titus chapter 1. Titus chapter 1. Verse 5. For this reason I left you in Crete, that you would set in order what remains, and appoint elders in every city as I directed you. There is an order for local churches. And part of that order involves having elders that will rule over local churches. And Paul mentions appointing elders and then goes on to give qualities of such men. But he wants Titus to put the churches in Crete in order. Well, what does that mean? Well... The apostles were traveling and teaching and they were giving the Lord's commandments and they expected those commandments to be followed and obeyed. And so he sends Titus to Crete or Titus stays there in Crete to help the churches there come to understanding of that order. You follow me? All right. Let me give me 25 seconds, okay? Okay. Let's tie some things together where we've been. I want you to see the logic of everything. First lesson, God is in charge. He is the authority, and so we are to obey him because he is the authority. He has given authority to Jesus, who delegated authority to the apostles, who were inspired by the Spirit, and they taught, and their teachings are authoritative and must be obeyed. God has spoken to us. He hasn't left us in the dark wondering what he wants from us, he's told us. And he's done that in a way that we can understand. And finally, tonight's lesson, if God has spoken to us in a language that we can understand, it shouldn't surprise us that other people, even those from different religious traditions, have understood these same common elements of God's communication. Okay? All right. Lesson six is coming off the press Tomorrow, okay, it will be emailed to you, and we will have hard copies available for Sunday. Thank you, everybody.